John 14, verse 7. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Let's pray together. Great God, we thank you for your word. We receive it as it is, the inspired, infallible, inerrant word. Come by the Holy Spirit and teach us its truths. Write them on our hearts for your name and for your glory. Amen. This is an amazing sequence of verses, and we have to stop somewhere at the end of a sermon and start somewhere the next time we uh, start a sermon. It's hard to just walk through the entire passage, which would be an extension from chapter 13 through to 16 and then the prayer of Jesus in chapter 17. But we have to stop somewhere, and we have to start somewhere. And we stopped last time looking at the familiar words of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Many Christians in our world go to their deaths even this week because of those words, because they will not compromise those words. Those are not the words drummed up, And manufactured by Christians, these are the words of Jesus. That's what he said about himself. He said to those before him, the eleven now, Judas having departed, you know the way. And Thomas had said, "Uh, sorry, I missed that one. I I, I didn't quite get that. Uh, Can you spell it out for me? We don't know the way. And Jesus was basically saying, you do know the way, you know me. And in knowing me, you know the way. I am the way. I'm the map you need to get you where you need to go. I am the way, the only authorized way to the Father. There are not three ways to God or 84 ways to God. Jesus said, I am the Word, the Word made flesh. I am the way, the truth, the life. The definite article is used rather than a way, the way. And those are His words. What do you do with that? Well, what we don't do is say, well, he didn't really mean it, or uh, I'd like to interpret it differently. No, there's only one true interpretation, and that is to recognize the meaning of the words he used. And the Holy Spirit has authorized us and uh, given us this word to show us this is the Christ we have to deal with. There isn't another one. And Jesus made it clear that a false Christ could not save. The reason for that is the false Christ doesn't exist. There isn't another one. There isn't a second one you and I can believe in. Just as there there isn't two gods or three gods or 84 gods or a million gods, there's only one, and he is the one who's revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ, in the Word of God. This is the one we have to deal with. There isn't another one out there. You and I might like to construct our own God that would be more palatable for us, one that we can say, I I like this one better than the one in the Bible, but there's a biblical word for that, and it's called idolatry. We don't like that thought because we think, well, I feel the right to make up my own God. And you know what? The U.S. Constitution gives us the right to do that. You can start your own religion and not be prosecuted. Actually, praise God for the freedom of that. You have the legal right to be a heretic. (laughs) 
Now, that's not always been true in the history of our world. And back in olden days, people were sent to the blocks, people were burnt at the stake for heresy, and we say, how terrible, and it is. But we need to recognize that in those days, they actually believed there was something called heaven, a place called heaven and a place called hell, and that people go to one of two destinations. And if people believed heresy, they would believe in a false god who would lead them not to truth and to the real God, but away from Him. And so those who were purveyors of the false doctrine were considered a blight to the community to such an extent if people believed them, they'd go to hell. And that's far worse than a drug pusher. You know, if a drug pusher just knocked on your door at night and said, look, I'd like to sell you and your children some drugs to enslave you for the rest of your lives. Uh, What would you do? You, You wouldn't be kind about that. You would say, uh, I, I don't even know what you would say, but you, you wouldn't react too well. But do you realize the heretic in the street who is knocking on your door to hand out a pamphlet purveying a false god and a false gospel is something doing something far worse than that. The drug pusher will just cause you to lose your life quickly. The false purveyor of doctrine will cause you, if you believe what they say, to go to hell forever. And so back in olden days, people thought, it's far better to get rid of that in our community than let them live, because if they live, they'll keep spouting the heresy. Now, we may not agree with the measures they took, but we need to try and understand heaven and hell were real to them. The problem in our day is no one believes in heaven or hell. But if you do, the way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And he is the joy of all heaven. And he said he would come back and receive his believers to himself. That's more than heaven. Heaven is not just a place where our bills are paid or we have no bills, where we can have eternal golf games and never lose, just keep playing. Okay, we, we lost at 18, but let's do the 19th hole and the 185th hole. I mean, you've got time there. But that's not what heaven is for the Christian. Heaven is seeing Christ. And in seeing Christ, we see the Father, and that's the message we pick up in verse 7. Jesus said, if you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. Now, what is amazing about this is the disciples did know Jesus. They'd just spent over three years with him at close quarters. They weren't just visiting him for the day and every three weeks just listening to him for an hour. They lived the life of Jesus in the sense of they were around him all the time. When they slept, he slept. When he slept, they slept. When he ate, they ate. When he talked, they were listening. Yet they had a weak understanding of him. They did know him, but they had an inadequate understanding of him. Leon Morris writes this, They had known him well enough to leave their homes and friends and livelihood to follow him wherever he went. But they did not know him in all his full significance. And Jesus was about to change all that. Jesus was going to connect the dots for them to, to actually see what was right in front of them and had been all along. If you'd known me, you'd have known my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him, verse 7 says. You see, Jesus did more than merely represent God. Jesus shows us God. Ezekiel or Jeremiah or one of the prophets could never say what Jesus said about him. From now on in seeing me, you've seen God. You've seen the Father. But Jesus could say that because he was a prophet, but more than that. He was someone who brought the truth, but more than that, he is truth itself. So we know what God is like when we look at Jesus. I remember having a conversation with a young lady in her 20s who was doubting her walk with God and not really sure whether she wanted to continue on in the Christian faith because she had a problem with God. And uh, some people's remedy to to that is, well, you just got to forgive him. (laughs) That's not right. God has never made a mistake. If God obliterated every one of us on planet Earth and did it every second week, he'd still be within his rights as a holy God to do that. And God has never done any wrong. 
But in talking to her, I said, well, I, I see you've got a problem with God. You're talking about the Father then. And she says, yes. I said, well, do you have a problem with Jesus? I, she said, no. I said, well, here's the thing. Look at Jesus and you'll see the true nature of God. Because God is a Christ-like God. My advice to you is reread the Gospels and see Jesus in action. Do you see him going about terrorizing people? Do you see him putting uh, all sorts of calamities on, on people? No, you see him doing the exact opposite. You see him with compassion. You see him with love. And that's the Father in action. That's Jesus' own testimony. If you see me in action, it's my Father in me doing the works. I don't do a thing unless I hear my Father say it, unless I see my Father do it. So reread the Gospels, and apparently that was a big help to her because in seeing Jesus in the Gospels, she then began began to understand the true nature of God. God is a Christ-like God. From now on, he says, you do know him and have seen him. From now on, notice that these words were said with just hours to go before the cross. And your understanding of God is going to be exponentially increased as I go through this and you see me raised from the dead and you see that I go to my Father. You see me ascend to the Father and you see that the Holy Spirit has been sent. Your understanding from this point on is going to increase dramatically. Verse 8, Philip said to him, Okay, I'm with you. Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. I love Philip here because he's speaking for the others. I, I'm with you. I'm tracking with you. I, I, I get it. So, so just show us the Father. And, and, and that's going to be enough. You know, There were people that saw God in some form in the Old Testament, but they never saw God as he truly was. The Scripture makes that clear. One of the reasons I don't use the King James Version is because of how it relates this particular verse. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show, S-H-E-W, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. You've got to really work at that. You've got to practice in front of a mirror, I think, to say, sufficeth. Can can we all try that together? (laughs) Sufficeth, yes. I'm not sure we even understand what it means, but that's sufficient for us. That's what it means. That's enough for us. Now, back when the King James Version was written, people talked about that all the time. Uh, Just go down to the store, get some groceries, and that sufficeth us. But that's not how we talk today. But Philip was expressing the deep longing of the soul to see God. I'm tracking with you. I, I, I want to see God. I, I, I want to know him like I know you. And I, I, I want to have a personal, intimate relationship with God. I want that. So, so give us some display. Give us some audio, visual display. And, and that's going to be enough. I know you can do it. You've got power at your hands. You can summon angels. But whatever you have to do to get us through this, do it and that will be enough for us. So Philip here expresses the deep, longing of the human heart. Show me God. Let me see God. Give me a display, something that I can take from this time that it's going to keep me during the hard times, during the storms. And we understand that. But Jesus was about to give him much more than that. If we fast forward in the New Testament to Second Peter, Peter writes about the time when he saw the Lord Jesus transfigured on the mountain when the glory of God so shone through just seeing Jesus that they were uh, amazed. And a voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved son. And in terms of experience, that was it. It was not even all of the disciples who were there witnessing that event. It was Peter, James, and John. He was there on the holy mountain and he speaks of it. He saw the majestic glory and he he unravels in a few words this amazing experience. But then he says, but we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a light shining in a dark place. And his whole purpose was said in terms was saying this, in terms of experience, I had the big one. But when you've got the Word of God, you've got something much more sure. 
Some of us have had experiences and then three weeks later say, say uh, did that really happen? And we can begin to doubt. And in terms of experience, he had the big one, but he says, what you have is more sure than that, more than the testimony of a true apostle in seeing the Lord Jesus. You've got the Word of God, and we have the Word of God today. And that's better. That's better than the experience that Jesus could give Philip at this moment. And that's what he goes on to say. Give me a display. That's enough for me. That's enough for us. Isn't that right, Tommy boy? Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you all the way. Just, just, just let us see you uh, in, a, in a way that shows us the Father. I mean, do whatever you have to do. I don't know. And I'm going to put, uh, put you in a box and say you have to do it this way. And, and, and Jesus just kicked the box. Now, there's nothing wrong in this request, except that in expressing that request... Jesus then exposed the inherent ignorance in the question. He's basically saying this, Jesus in response, uh, Philip, you're asking for something already available to you. In fact, you're asking for what you already have. In seeing me in action, you have all your heart has ever longed for. It's already been given to you because you see me, but yet you haven't fully comprehended me. I remember watching a series of lectures by Dr. R.C. Sproul called The Holiness of God, and uh, was very much impacted by it, until about 10 or 12, 13 years later, I re-watched it and realized, though I was impacted by that series, I hadn't really heard it. I hadn't really seen it. I'd watched it, but hadn't seen. There was so much there that I didn't catch first time round. And just in a little limited sense, Jesus is saying that to his disciples. You've been around me. You've seen me. You've watched me do the miracles. You've seen me heal uh, the, 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 the leper. You've seen me restore sight to the blind, turn, uh, t- turn, turn water into wine. You, you, you've seen it all, but you, you haven't really seen me. And in seeing me, you would have seen much more than that which is merely visible. You haven't fully comprehended me. You haven't fully understand, understood me. But now that you have seen me, something is now about to change. Look at our text. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It is enough for us. Jesus answered to him. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? He knew him, but not as he could know him. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? John has already made this clear in the opening chapter, in chapter 1, verse 18, where he writes, No one has ever seen God the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, and it's a word that means to exegete. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen one who exegetes the Father. He reveals the Father. He shows us the Father as no one else can. Again, Ezekiel couldn't do this. John the Baptist couldn't do this. No mere man could, but the God-man could. The Word became flesh. Now, the Father and the Son are distinct. They're distinct as persons. We read that in the first verse of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, side by side, pros, face to face, with God, yet the Word was God. There's a unity in essence, and yet there's a distinction. The Father's not the Son. The Son is not the Father. But the Son perfectly reveals the Father. It's interesting, as was read earlier in the service, Hebrews chapter 1, it speaks of Christ in verse 3. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. To see Christ is to see God in action. The word there is related to the word icon. The reason why God does not want icons is because in one sense he already has one, the authorized one, the one who makes the Father known. 
God the Father is invisible. Let me read a couple of scriptures. Colossians 1, 15. He, talking of Christ, is the image of the invisible God. 1 Timothy 1, 17. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The third one is 1 John 4, 12. No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. And back to John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God. The same writer. 1 John as the Gospel of John. Same words. No one has ever seen God. The only God, the Son, who's at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Look at verse 9 with me. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long? Still don't know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And again, don't make the mistake of saying that the Son is the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. No, Jesus, if you read the, uh, the, 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 the first chapter and the well, all the way through to the 17th chapter, when Jesus prays in the 17th chapter, he's not praying to himself. He's praying to the Father as the Son. Distinct, and yet they're one in essence. To see Christ, to comprehend Christ, to fully understand Him, you would then see and comprehend the Father in Christ. Jesus came into the world not only to save us, (coughs) but to show us God. And the more we know Christ, the more we know God. Verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? That's quite a question. Now here, it's obvious, isn't it? Our minds bump into majesty and bump into mystery. To say, yeah, I I, I get that, I, I comprehend that, is to comprehend what is incomprehensible. It blows our mind. It blows the gaskets. There's nothing in our heads that can say, I can fully wrap my head around that. Yeah, the Father's in the Son. The Son's in the Father. Yeah, I get all that. No, we don't. But there seems to be, at least in words that we can communicate, a mutual indwelling. I'm in Him. He's in me. There's a mysterious union here. And it's bringing out the point that Christ is not merely a great messenger. He's not even the highest messenger. He is that, but He's more than that. The Father has come to us in the Son. The one unseen is made visible by the one who is seen. And then we read these words. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does His works. So even in this, He's speaking forth what his father wants him to say. All I do, all I say is a revelation of the father because as John 5.30 says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In John 12, familiar territory again, Jesus cried out, verse 44, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. This is a familiar theme to us. Verse 48, the one who rejects me does not re- and does not receive my words has a judge. The, words that, the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. See, the Son does the will of the Father, and he has no other agenda. In John 6, he revealed the Father's will that of all that God had given him, the elect, it was the Father's will that the Son lose none of them but raise it, the entire group, up on the last day. Jesus never has to report to the Father and, says, and say, uh, uh, Father, I'm sorry, I lost three today. I lost 28. Phoenix has not been good for us this week. But you want to hear about Tucson? No, we don't even want to go to about, talk about Tucson. Jesus will never have to report to the Father and say, I lost one of those you gave me. Because that's the will of the Father. And Jesus always does the will of the Father. John 6, 39. Look in verse 11 with me. Believe me 
that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Here he's talking about mission. There's a unity of purpose. They're one in mission. And it's Jesus who shows us the mission of the Father by carrying out the mission of the Father. You ever heard about, have you ever seen the Rosetta Stone Monument? Well, it's very helpful to us. I uh, understand this by what scholars say. But in the realm of hieroglyphics, your what hurts? Uh, hieroglyphics. It's an ancient language, and it was seemingly incomprehensible to us until a stone monument known as the Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799. Now, it became something like a key, a master key, in the aid of translation. That's because this monument had on it three passages, three texts, in three different languages, including Greek and hieroglyphics. Now, we knew a lot about Greek, but we knew very little to nothing about hieroglyphics. But here's where the stone became very, very helpful to us. In seeing the words in Greek and then comparing them to the hieroglyphics, by taking what we knew and then comparing it with what we don't know, we were then able to determine what we didn't know by means of what we knew. We compared the Greek, which we did know, with the hieroglyphics that we didn't know, and we were able to use it as a key to understand what we had not known before. Rick Phillips writes this, When it comes to knowing God, Jesus is like the Rosetta Stone. This was part of a 2nd century BC Egyptian monument discovered during Napoleon's Nile campaign in 1799. Its value comes from being inscribed with a text in three languages, including hieroglyphic and Greek. Given the Greek translation of the ancient hieroglyphics, scholars were able to greatly advance their understanding of the ancient Egyptian language, which would otherwise have remained a mystery to them. Likewise, God the Father would remain a mystery to us unless Jesus had come. We had learned God's basic character and requirements in the Old Testament, but we could not see God and have a personal knowledge of Him until Jesus came. And just as linguists looked at the Greek on the Rosetta Stone and were able to read the hieroglyphic, so also we see Jesus and are able to interpret God the Father. I think that's a very helpful illustration. You see, you may wonder about God. Is He really compassionate? Does he really care? Then look at Jesus. Will, will, will he stoop to, to touch us when we hurt? Well, not only does he do that, he touches a leper and heals. Is God able to hand your, handle your issues, stand, st- help you stand in the midst of the storm? Well, look at Jesus calming the winds and the waves. You see, God is acting in and through the Son in all He says and in all He does. Ladies and gentlemen, in Christ, we see God fully displayed. Paul writes of it this way. In Christ, Colossians 2.9, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Look with me in verse 12. Truly, truly, John 14, 12, I say to you, again, Jesus speaking, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Now, much can be said about this and I want to take a little bit of time with this, the rest of our time, in this 12th verse. Let me start by saying this. God gave us books, books of the Bible. He didn't just send down a verse here and there. And then people say, well, I got verse 37. What did you get? I got verse 16. Oh, well, um, maybe if we find 17, we can put them together somewhere and, and, and compile a list of verses. No, God gave us and God inspired books of the Bible. 
And so to interpret any one verse in our Bible correctly, we must find out what the setting is, find out what the context is, because we're liable to take things out of context and just hone in on a verse and not see what went before it or what came after it, what the context was. I've often used this illustration. Suppose I went for a few days, maybe a weekend, to New York in February. It's a cold time of year, and I write an email to Elder Doug, and I say, uh, everything's going well, and then suddenly, the electricity goes off. And the electricity goes off not only in the hotel I'm staying at, but in the city of New York and all around the region, and then it's discovered that the whole electrical grid on, in the northeast has gone down, and immediately what was heating the hotel room and the offices and homes in the New York area now is not working, and people are quickly getting cold. And we're talking about cold to a degree that we don't experience here in Arizona. They were very, very cold. This is all uh, hypothetically, but just imagine this, and I then uh, get the computer, the little thing I've got, and it's battery operated. I can still use it without the electricity functioning, and I write in this email, Doug, everyone in New York is cold tonight. Now, you and I understand now the context of those words. But imagine 500 years from now, someone somewhere in cyberspace discovers this email. It's not a parchment, it's not a papyrus, it's an email. And uh, 500 years from now, they discover John writes to Doug, and they take a little line out of what I say, and they say, John Samson said, everyone in New York is cold. And what they do with that is then they say, well, obviously we have the doctrine of New York people not liking folk from Arizona. They are hostile to anyone from outside the state. It's obvious. How could John be more clear? Everyone, not just a few, everyone in New York is cold. I'm sure it would have been their experience in the 21st century. If they admitted that they came from out of state, they would have been shunned. They would have been sought out as to be banished from that region. They do not like people from outside the state of New York. Everyone in New York is cold, and they perpetuate this doctrine. Do you know, as silly as that is, that's what happens many times when it comes to our Bible interpretation. We take a little verse out of its setting, part of a verse, or part of a setting where if we just read around the words to the words before or the word afterwards, the interpretation we've come up with would not stand. And here's the problem with that. I wasn't saying that everybody in New York is cold in and on an emotional level. The context screamed cold in temperature. And cold in temperature was the true interpretation of the word cold. And anything else was a false interpretation. Yeah, but I've always believed that New York people are cold because I, 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 I kind of read it. And, and, and that's my tradition. And, and, and I know someone who went there sometime and they felt the same way. And what do you do with that? You, you might say, well, can we read the original email uh, in its fullness? No, I'm not interested, thank you. I believe everyone in New York are cold hearted people. They're, they're hateful people. No, God gave us books. And there's a context to every verse in our Bibles. And to understand a verse, we must understand the context. So we ask questions of the text. And this is not simply for scholars. This is not for the elite who have got this gracious now gift that no one else has. No, you can ask questions. You can read the verses before. You can read the verses afterwards. And we do this all the time in our conversations. When we get to know someone, when you understand where they're coming from, you, you interpret their words more accurately than a stranger. With a stranger, you say, where's this guy coming from? When you know someone, you, you know when he talks what he's talking about. So when a promise is made, it's right to ask questions like, when? When was the promise made? Who? To whom was the promise made? 
What? What is the promise? All right, keep your finger in, or something in John 14. We'll be back. Let's go to 2 Chronicles. That's quite a leap, isn't it? 2 Chronicles. Yeah, let's go there. 2 Chronicles. Let me read to you a very familiar verse. I've seen it used so many places as prayer is being made for various different nations. I saw this used in England. It's being used here today in the States. Verse 14, very familiar to us. I could even sing this to you. I'll withhold that blessing from you. (laughs) Verse 14, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves. This is 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, let's ask a question. Is this a verse we can claim for today? Well, can we pray and as God's people repent in such a way that God says, all right, all of you have repented, I'm now going to heal their land, your land. Well, let's ask the question, whose land? Can folk from Belgium claim this promise? How about India? How about China? If the, if the people of China who are Christians do what verse 14 says, will, will God take communism away? Will there be no concentration camps? Will, will, will there be nothing that causes anything of, of, of nastiness in the country? Will, will the land be healed? Will it be true of, of Tibet? Would it be true of America? The answer is no, because the promise was given to a specific people. We only have to re- read the beginning of the verse to understand the who here. My people who are called by my name. You see, verse 14 is in a context of a book. Read verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord, and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. This place. Just make a note of that in your mind. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land, ask yourself which land, and I think the answer is obvious, or send pestilence among my people, question who are my people, I think the answer is obvious, Israel, It restates it in verse 14. If my people, that's Israel, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Again, he's emphasizing the location. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house. Underline that phrase, this house, that my name may be there. Underline the word there, forever. My eyes and my heart will be there. Underline the word there, for all time. I don't know how he could be more persistent in just telling us what he is talking about. Verse 17, and as for you, if you walk before me, if who walks before me? Israel. As David your father walked, doing according to all that I've commanded you, you being Israel, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal line, as I covenanted with David your father, saying, you shall not lack a man to rule Israel. Why did he mention Israel? Because he's talking about Israel all along. Verse 19, but if you turn aside and forsake my statutes, who? Israel. And my commandments that I, gave, uh, that I have set before you, who's the you? Israel. And go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you, who's the you? Israel. Up from my land, oh, oh, my land, that I have given you, is he talking there about Australia? 
No, it's still Israel. And this house that I've consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house, underline that, at this house, which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Isn't it obvious who my people are? I think it is. The promise was given to a specific people, Israel. And as bad as things get, if God's people repent, God will heal that land. Let's go to another one of these, Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, and we see these words in Christian bookstores and on Christian t-shirts, and we send it. People... You know, they sign their name and they put Jeremiah 29, 11 at the, uh, right under their name as a promise for everybody. Well, is it a promise for everybody? Genesis, Exodus, Jeremiah. Chapter 29. Here we go. You know this one. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. There you go. Well, that's, that's the Bible. I'm, I, I believe that. Well, yeah, I, I believe that. I, I actually believe Jeremiah 29, 11. But have we ever taken time to see who the promise was made to? Is it a promise made for everybody? Well, let's look. Here's the context. Israel, you've not heeded my repeated warnings time after time, over and over. I've told you to repent, and you have not. And now, the very worst thing you can imagine is about to happen. That's right. You're under severe judgment on a level worse than your worst nightmare. You, Israel, people of God, are about to be taken against your will out of the land all the way to Babylon. In other words, though I've warned you and warned you and warned you, you've not heeded those warnings. You've said, we've got the temple. God would never do anything to, to harm us because of the temple. No, hear this. I am abandoning you. I am washing my hands of you. Most of you will die in a foreign land. But here's something to hold on to. I'm not abandoning you utterly. Israel, though you're under severe judgment, I have good plans for you. Most of you, if not all of you, will die. But your children and your grandchildren will be alive to see me rescue you. Seventy years from now, I'll bring you back to this land. That's the context, ladies and gentlemen. Look in verse 4. This says the Lord of hosts, the God of who? Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Do good in the city now I've sent you to, in Babylon. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for, its, for in its welfare you'll find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of who? Israel. Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Jeremiah was often dealing with false prophets who were giving a very nice personal word to everyone. Everything's going to be great. It's going to get better. 2020 is going to be awesome. <laughs> That's not in the text, but. <laughs> For this says the Lord, 
When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and will bring you back to what? This place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You shall seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the true interpretation of Jeremiah 29, 11. Is it a verse for everybody? No, not at all. So someone might say, okay, well, while it may not be a promise for everyone, it's still a principle that applies to everyone. No. No, really? Have you ever thought that one through? You see, God knows the end from the beginning, right? He declares that. Actually, more than that, He not only knows it because He has decreed the end from the beginning. He knows the lifespan of everybody in this place. He knows your birthday. He already knows your death day. The psalmist wrote this. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Ray Comfort brings this as an analogy. I think it's very, very helpful. You've been called to go preach, Uh, and it's not 9-11-2001, it's 9-10. It's the day before the towers come down. And your assignment is to go to one of those two towers, to one of the floors, and speak to people who will be returning the next day. And somehow it is communicated to you, supernaturally, an angel perhaps comes and tells you, I don't know how it is communicated, but you are of this knowledge that everybody you're about to talk to will return the next day and every one of them will be dead. Would that knowledge change what you would say when you go with your message to preach? Would it change? Would you need to alter it? Would you still talk about eight ways to a happy life? Would you still say God has great plan? God loves you and has a great plan for your life. No, his plan is that they die in 24 hours. And that 24 hours from now, they'll either be jumping out of the window or crushed. It's hard to even face that. But if you thought that through and if you had to make an adjustment to your message, what you had planned to say was not the gospel. You see, if you've got the gospel... It doesn't matter if it's 9.10, 9.12, 9.28. The gospel doesn't change. Now, here's the assignment. The angel says to you, let's again go in our imagination. You know those facts that they're all going to be dead, but you're not allowed to tell them. You're not allowed to give that information away. You know it, but you're not allowed to communicate it. You know what I would do? I'd preach the gospel. And I would say something like this. With all the urgency and the fire in my head and heart of love for you, I urge you, be right with a holy God. You and I don't know we've got tonight to even make this kind of decision. Today is the day of salvation. In fact, the Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And all of you have grieved God, this holy God, this majestic God. He has every right to end your life at this moment, but in His grace He allows you to hear these words and commands you to repent and believe the good news. What is that good news? That although God is holy, you have committed cosmic treason against God. But in His love for humanity, He sent His Son into the world to live a perfect life, die an atoning death on the cross, be raised from the dead, 
And ladies and gentlemen, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be rescued from fire that is coming. I call upon you with every passion in my heart. Come to God. Repent. Believe the gospel. Your very eternal life is on the line. And I'd say that this day and I'd say it that day because the gospel, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't change. Amen. Amen. God is holy, man is sinful, and God in his love has sent his son into the world. Well, but that's not going to be popular. People might not... If you want to grow a church, you you don't say that. No, 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 no. I do want to grow a church, but I want it to be a church. And for it to be a church, you know what you need? Christians. And for you to have Christians, you know what you need? Conversion. And to have conversions, you know what you need? The Word of God. Not entertainment, not the right mood, not the right setting, and people making an emotional decision. No, faith comes not by those means, but by hearing the Word of Christ. So to get a church, you need Christians. To get Christians, you need the Word. So preach the Word in season and out of season. And I've come to understand that covers it all. I mean, figs are either in season or out of season, right? That covers it. But people won't like it. I understand, but the elect will. Paul knew going into Corinth, he says, I know what Greeks want, they want wisdom, and I know what Jews want, they want signs and power displays. But we preach Christ crucified. It makes no sense except to the called, which is a word for the elect. Christ's sheep will not be offended by Christ's voice. All right, real quick. John 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. To whom is the promise made? Note the primary audience, the 11 disciples. And just as they'd been told in the same address... Verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Words spoken to the apostles. He's saying this in verse 12. You believe in me, any of you. Any of you who? Any of you apostles. You believe in me, you'll do what I've been doing. What he did not mean was this, that they would show themselves to be divine as he was. Of course not. That they would forgive sins as he did. Of course not. Did they be turning water into wine as he did? No, those were signs of his divinity. John makes that clear. They would walk on water, really? Well, Peter did for a time, but he got that sinking feeling. (laughs) They would atone for sins? Is that what is in view when they would do the same works? Would they atone for sins? Of course not. They would die on the cross to redeem people? No, not at all. They would take away the sins of the world? No, of course not. There's only one divine Son of God, only one Lamb of God. So what does it mean? Just as Jesus had power over disease and demons and death, the apostles would continue the ministry of Jesus. Acts 1 verse 1, all that Jesus began to do and teach. He's still alive, he's still doing, he's still teaching. And they would work similar works. And this was fulfilled in the book of Acts. Do you know this was a promise fulfilled? Acts 2, 42. And or, verse 43, came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Who are the apostles? The people that were hearing John 14, 12 in their hearing. Acts 5, 12. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done by the, uh, among the people by the hands of the apostles. Peter came by and his shadow fell on some of them and they were healed. Acts 5, 15. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of a true apostle were, apo- were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. This is where we'll close. If everyone could do those signs, think about this, nothing would mark apostles out as distinct in any way. If little Jordan Jones 
could do everything an apostle could do, what he did would not show that he was an apostle, or maybe it would, but wouldn't show apostles if they could do it, that they were apostles unless only apostles can do it. So that's the works. Let's finish with this. What are the greater works? Jesus said, you'll do the works. He's talking to the apostles, but what are the greater works? Well, again, think of works. Lazarus being raised from the dead. I mean, how dead do you have to be for it to be better than that? I can't think of something greater than that. They're not degrees of deadness. Well, this guy's dead, but you want to really see George over there. He's really dead. (laughs) How about healing from leprosy? Can you do better than that? How about transfiguration? Can you do that? How about feeding 5,000? Can you do that? There's no record that anyone else did that. No, there's a limitation on works. So what are the greater? Real quick, greater in terms of extent, greater in terms of location, greater in terms of territory. Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Didn't minister in Egypt, didn't minister in Africa. Israel today is about the size of New Jersey. To give you an idea of that, Israeli pilots starting in central Israel can fly about two and a half minutes east or west before they cross the boundary of of Israel. Now, the apostles' ministry will extend to the whole world. It's greater in location. It's greater in duration. Jesus ministered for about three and a half years There are many ministers alive in our day who've been ministering for decades. You know that. Greater in numbers, in the amount of people reached. We're not told how many people followed Jesus authentically. What we do know is on Acts 2, Peter preached and 3,000 souls were converted. And the influence of the early church covered the entire Roman Empire and beyond in a very short space of time. And ladies and gentlemen, this gospel is being heard thousands of miles away from the original source. Through the printed page, through TV, radio, satellite, the internet, YouTube, there's a far greater extent of the gospel than in Jesus' ministry. So location, duration, numbers, and influence. Why? We'll close with this, because I'm going to the Father. Because he goes to the Father, he can send the Holy Spirit to empower the church to preach the gospel in season, out of season. He has gone there, he is there, and he calls on you and me, all of us, to repent and believe the good news. Let me stress upon you. What are you going to do with this word? Judas heard all of Christ's sermons. Didn't miss a one of them. Yet he was a lost man. What will you do with the words of Jesus today? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for it being trustworthy and true. We ask that you would call men and women, boys and girls, to yourself, even through the message today that they may know you, Jesus, and in knowing you, know the Father also. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.